He almost won the Junior Speed Chess Championship. This year, he became the latest Super Grandmaster from the United States when he crossed the 2700 marker. And Jeffrey Zhang's journey in Conti Monsis, Siberia is not over yet. Let's take a look at this exciting tiebreak, a battle that went down between him and the number one player from the Netherlands, Anish Giri. So we started out and had a one knight of three move, but very quickly transposed into an e4 game. After the moves bishop g7 and d6, we are officially in a modern defense or a pierce. Uh, in this particular opening, you get a lot of different transpositions on a structural level to things that can be beneficial for Sicilian players, Dragon players, obviously modern and Pierce players. So if you happen to have any of those openings, either as part of black or white in your repertoire, there's going to be some instructive takeaways for you in this game in regards to what happened in the critical moments of the middle game and what maybe could have been played better by both players on a pawn structure level. So after d6, we get the move bishop e3. Knight to f6, knight c3, castles. Okay, these are all very standard things to do. And now the move queen to d2. Uh, queen to d2 is sort of combining a couple of different approaches white can play against a modern. Normally when you see things like queen to d2 and you get this battery of a queen and bishop where the obvious intention is to head to h6 and try to eliminate this piece, normally you have a pawn on f3 in some of these structures. And the advantage is there is that with a pawn on f3, you're supporting things like g4, which in turn support h5 and lead to a more traditional Yugoslav attack. A knight on f3 is going to be subject to different different targets, like what we're eventually going to see in the game with bishop g4. The g4 square is also open to the knight in some positions, um, but the knight on f3 also has other types of advantages in the center early, and of course you've sped up your development. So these are just some little takeaways, not necessarily uh, hugely critical, but because it's an obscure kind of position or line, I, I spent some time looking at it and found out that Anish Giri is kind of a proponent of this particular move order. He's played it many times. Um, unfortunately, not with the best results. I, I found uh, several games where he was also, again, on the losing side as white in blitz. So we'll mention those. In fact, the first one should be mentioned here where 6c6 was played in our own speech as championship by Shakriar Mohamed Yarov. Um, of course, Giri eventually won that match, but this is a game he lost after bishop h6. b5, bishop d3, and bishop g4, as I highlighted some of the dysfunction of having a knight on f3 instead of a pawn. Um, Mamad Yarv eventually went on to win that game, and you can you can take a look at it. Of course, like I said, it was from our own speech as championship. Knight to c6 was played here in this game by Zhang, and after the move d5, the move knight to b8 was played. But to quote another game that unfortunately Geary lost, I would have to say that knight to b4 was played by Levon Aronian. Once again, in our speech as championship in 2018, this is a match that Geary did go on to lose along with this game. After a3, knight a6, black is losing time, but uh, hopeful, hopeful, hopefully going to head to c5, where you have to give up the dark square bishop. Because of that, White wants to trade the light square bishop, but then in some of these positions you get the rook combined with the power of this dragon bishop. And in a practical setting like Blitz, Black often gets very good queenside counterplay. So uh, it's not to imply at all that this variation, whether knight b4 or knight b8 as Young played, is, is not slightly better for White, like a lot of different openings are. Just pointing out that, uh, unfortunately for Anish, despite his preference clearly in this in this kind of obscure, like I said, sort of semi Classical, modern, cla uh, Yugoslav attack idea with this hybrid development with the knight on f3. Um, he hasn't had the best results. So anyway, d5, knight to b8 is played. After bishop to h6, we're, we're in the game now with Jeffrey Zhang. And white does black willingly lose that time with the knight to go back to b8? Well, it's, it's precisely to play an idea like c6. One of the things that happens in these positions where both sides are going to castle on opposite sides of the board is in, in these structures where the kings are going to find themselves away from each other, both sides obviously aggressively trying to open up lines. And so the whole point of black to lose this time willingly and induce d5 is so that you can play c6 and even try to play b5, and you're just trying to open up more lines for, for yourself on the queen side. That's obviously going to be a theme in this game, and, and that's the reason you afford yourself that loss of time. So bishop takes g7, takes castles long. This is very typical. Uh, queen to a5 is a move that is theoretically a little more popular than the move order that um, uh, Jeffrey played here with the move c takes d5. Queen a5, of course, hits a2, so often black will run into king to b1. And now after b5, white can take on c6. And there's a lot of different ways this game can go. Um, one thing to note is that typically taking b5 is, is ill-advised after things like knight takes e4, remove the defender, and then of course black is, is very, very happy with the open b file from, from now and throughout the rest of the game. So these again are very typical 
modern ideas. Obviously, that's the move order we had here, but also very similar to Sicilian's. So in this game, c takes d5 was played, and after e takes d5, we get bishop g4. So, you know, this theme is just, it's not to highlight that that this is a bad line at all for Geary. It's, it's really not. In fact, I think that white um, should be slightly better, but it's just not going to be the most traditional version where you would, you would, you would see white with this pawn structure aggressively trying to expand. Um, one variation I can actually show with that just to highlight exactly what I'm talking about would be in a traditional Sicilian. So if we were going to go down this line just to really highlight what you can take away, here we get f3. This is a Yugoslav attack. And in a variation with nine castles long here, we get the trade. Bishop e6 threatens queen a5. So white plays king to b1, which prevents queen a5 due to ideas like knight d5 with a discovery and you take e7 inner mizzo. So black plays queen to c7 instead. And then in variations where you get d5 anyway and the rook goes to c1, eventually white will try for things on the king's side. So this is, take a note, take a snapshot of this and remember the pawn structure and the ideas here, especially as it concerns ourselves with the idea of attacking on the king side and the idea of the open e file this transition that happens when white brings the knight to d5 leads to this pawn structure known as the marco hop where white has a target and black has the queen side but positionally white should be better in the long run in a lot of these cases because of that backward e7 pawn so this this type of position is is just to to put yourself in in the shoes of these players in terms of what they're thinking about on a pawn structure level so bishop g4 was met by bishop e2, and I, and I think on that note, if I was playing white with my own kind of Sicilian experience, I would have played something like rook e1 right away and immediately tried to play something closer to a Sicilian uh, Yugoslav attack. You allow taking f3, of course, with the double pawns, but often in these positions, the pawn on f3 will eventually go to f4, which not only holds things like the e5 square, but also threatens f5. So this, this would be a very, very similar position, which is why the dragon is kind of on my brain. So for those of you who are often critical of me when I'm analyzing these things too deeply and maybe providing a little bit of a long-winded context in regards to the approach and the pawn structure, that's the way my brain approaches chess. And honestly, from a pattern recognition standpoint, you should always be trying to apply themes that can be familiar and make you make you more aware of the potential tactics that are coming, the potential maneuvers that are effective, because pawn structures are kind of the skeleton. They repeat more often than specific developing moves. And this is something that um, when I'm analyzing this game, I can't help but think about those types of lines. And it's why it's why I think rookie one was was a little better than bishop e2, which the engines agreed with. But it's not about the engines. It's about my human understanding that I think rookie one just to me makes more sense here. Um, bishop to e2 is played. And after knight bd7, rook h to e1, black plays rook c8. You can also play rook e8 in some of these positions to overprotect the pawn. Rook c8 was played. And now the move knight d4 was played. And this is one that I, I can be a little critical of, because I, I do think that white goes down a path where black gets plenty of counterplay, which from a practical perspective is just uh, not where you want to be in blitz. Um, the... The line that I analyze where you just force the issue and try to get exactly the positional advantage that white should be playing for. You shouldn't be playing for a Yugoslav attack in a situation where you don't have the f3, g4, h5 anymore, right? You want to play to open up the structure, which is what Geary was doing here by putting the rooks in the center. So playing a move like h3 instead would have been a very logical follow-up. You force the trade. Obviously, moving the bishop to any other square allows it to be trapped, right, with g4. So the trade is forced. And the moment you open the e-file, the position becomes one where white can can focus positionally on, on the advantage. Um, variations like knight e5 will run into bishop e2, where you guard c4. And eventually, you're going to dislodge that knight from e5. It's not going to be a permanent home. So I analyzed the line with knight c4, queen d4. Obviously, you're threatening to take here on, on c4. So things like knight to b6, you can eventually move your bishop. And again, you have a positional edge that is known as sort of a Marco hop structure. You can also play for g4 and g5. This is very similar to the nine castles long variation of the Yugoslav attack Sicilian dragon. <clears throat> so um, b5 is probably the best practical approach for black in a lot of these dragons. You want to get counterplay come hell or high water when you're positionally worse and need an attack. So something like this, obviously here you're threatening knight c4, which would be a very nice fork and uh, maybe checkmate on b2. But queen e3, offering a queen trade, bishop e2 to guard c4, rook b8. I think that these types of positions, b3, you can try for king b2. This is a very, very typical, again, dragon kind of position. White's up a pawn, positionally better with the Marco Hop structure, but black has counterplay. But, but here it's unlike the game in the sense that all those things were featured for Geary in the game, but he wasn't up a pawn. 
So this would have sort of forced uh, Zhang to be super aggressive with the b5 approach from, from my point of view. Instead, he played knight d4. We get the trade, and we get the knight coming into c4. The regular counterplay happens here on the c-file, but um, white doesn't have the same either material edge or positional edge. f4 allowed knight c4, queen d3, and here Zhang gets a little bit immature in his approach and plays queen b6. And I, I say that in the, in the kindest way, in the sense that immature moves are sometimes that that adjective is used to describe immediate one move threats rather than like bigger picture I guess positional moves um, the problem after queen to b6 is that after white played b3 knight a3 white should have been better here after taking the e7 pawn um, it eventually got kind of uh, jumbled here in time pressure but if uh, if black had maybe played instead of queen to b6 something like rook e8 b3 and kept this square open again this is very similar to the line I was just showing but black's not down a pawn uh, knight to f3, the queen can bring pressure to the c-file. King b2 um, would, would be a very logical way to defend, but now we get, again, a very, very similar dragon theme exchange sacrifice where I think this type of endgame with getting a couple pawns for the rook um, and, and knight, the knight and two pawns for the rook would be would be very, very good for black. So um, I think uh, I think rook e8 would have been, would have been a, a slower, slightly more, I guess, mature, more experienced approach to the position. Queen b6 allowed b3. White wins the pawn, and so where does this go wrong for Geary? Well, queen to b4, knight d2, this all makes sense. You're defending the critical point. Black has an open c file, and you need to hold that down, otherwise the floodgates open, right? We've got c2 in the uh, in the uh, the goggles here, right? We've got them in the binoculars, so you got to guard it. Um, one thing to note is knight e6 check, although uh, the engines kind of suggest maybe this could have been an approach for white, you can totally understand why Geary didn't go for this. I, I looked at this for a while, and I'm not even sure the engines are right. Um, you know, if you take f8 in these positions, rook takes c3 is played immediately with tempo, so that immediate fork isn't even the purpose of it. You'd have to play knight c7, which just feels odd when you look at the fact that you brought a knight from d4 to c7. Uh, black can play knight g8, and yes, there's some crazy lines that go like rook e4, queen a5, rook a4. You sacrifice the piece, but then the knight ends up being trapped on a3. I don't really buy this as a as a realistic approach, even though long lines like this say that maybe maybe white could have been a little bit better with knight e6, but not something I think you can realistically be critical of. So knight d2 was played, rook to c5 to hit d5. This should be good for Geary. He's up a pawn. Um, perhaps instead of queen d4, you can immediately slide the queen to h3 like he tried to do later. You're going to see uh, the, the reason why the queen is very useful there in a second. But let's go with what he did, even though I think he missed a5 as, as the right response. The key is that now if you trade, obviously you're losing a piece, because moving the knight would allow Bob's your uncle on c2, right? Um, so I, I think it's possible he played queen d4 kind of missing a5. It was blitz, right? We have to be understanding of, of the time pressure. Um, now he played king b2, but the fact that he kind of had to respond with king b2 already puts the king on this very, very precarious looking spot when the b3 pawn is constantly pinned to ideas like check. But, but still he was okay. Rook c4, queen d3, rook fc8, uh, rook c1 over protecting the c2 pawn makes total sense. b5, here it goes, right? Um, again, this is why I don't like this approach compared to what I said earlier for Geary. That's why I was critical of the knight d4 move, because black does have a lot of counterplay here. But with best play, he should still be fine. Um, queen h3 is the idea I mentioned earlier, and one of the key points is that not only does it hit c8 in a lot of key positions, but you also have an immediate threat. Let me just show it. If, if something like rook takes c3 is played, for example, knight takes, knight c4 check, king a1, you move the knight back to b6, we can save the knight. In a lot of these positions, there's threats like queen to e6, and f7 is falling. Uh, there's also another line here for white after after queen h3, which is that if you play something like knight takes d5, white can immediately bail out with a draw by taking f7 and then taking h7 with a, pretty much what will be a big perpetual. The king goes back and forth, and, and you continue to give checks. So those sort of things would have been saving the game for Geary, but the practical pressure he was under, playing the white side of a very Yugoslav attacking dragon kind of position, those things are very risky and they lead to blunders. B5 was played as a move that overprotects the C4 square, and Geary just forgot that. Um, for example, why why was rook takes C3 not a threat before? Well, if rook takes C3 takes, rook takes C3 queen takes, and you play knight C4 check, you've sacrificed the house, and what do you got for it? 
I just took with my queen and I've got two rooks for a knight. That's a, that's a small material advantage, as they say, right? That's the scientific term. But Gary just forgot that b5 overprotects c4 and so that he has now renewed the threat, that being Zhang, of taking c3. This is a very common threat, a very important tactical pattern you just have to be aware of when you're playing the white side of these Yugoslav attack dragons where the b3 pawn is pinned. And so, again, this is, that's why I've been kind of highlighting the themes of that, the similarities in the structure of those openings, because people underestimate that, yes, positional chess and pawn structures have patterns that repeat. You learn to, you learn to see the forest through the trees, recognize weaknesses here and there, but also the tactical patterns that exist in a, in a certain type of structure occur over and over again too. So it's not just that pattern recognition is a positional one in terms of your ability to develop a high level plan because you're familiar with the structure, but also the tactics that you need to be aware of repeat in those types of positions. And in Blitz, you have to rely on your intuition because you don't have enough time to see these tactics coming like the knight to c4 idea. And Geary just blunders it with the move f5. Again, rook takes c3, takes, rook takes c3, and he can already probably resign. It was clear that he missed it. Again, just to highlight the point, if you had taken c3, knight c4, just wins the lady for free. Uh, you'd have to take with the queen. We take, and here comes c3, and, and mating nets, and, and black is just completely crushing. So um, again, after b5, instead, instead of f5, queen h3 was possible with multiple uh, ways to draw. I already highlighted the one. If the knight moves, you take and take here. There's also just a threat. If you play something like a4, for example, taking here and playing this check is also a, uh, a draw with check here and then check back. There's no way for the king to ever touch down without letting the knight be taken with check. And I'm pretty sure if you go this way, I can take and also still get a perpetual um, human human calculation right now. No engine, but I think I'm right. So um, those would have been the saving graces. Instead, f5 was played. Zhang flexes. He crushes through. And uh, after after just winning the two pieces for the rook, the problem is that also the attack continues here. Knight e5 defends everything. This king is still in huge trouble. We take and get the f-file, but those are just for kicks and giggles. When the queen comes here, devastating discoveries coming, winning on the spot. King b1, knight takes d5, rook d1. And I'll let you pause the video if you want to find the finishing touch, right? Put the icing on the cake here for uh, Jeffrey. Finds the very, very accurate rook to d3, exclam cutting off the threat and opening up the c3 square for the pony. When the trade happens, it's just a matter of time before knight c3 comes. So white allows the queen trade, which in the end means the rook is falling. So he took f7 for good measure before resigning on knight f4, right? Winning one extra pawn sometimes makes it taste a little better, but certainly uh, Geary wants to get the memory of this one um, out of out of his head. Unfortunately for him, he goes home from Conti Monsisk. Jeffrey Zhang moves on to the next round. And just a, a very, very clean, a very, very uh, nice victory here. Some blunders by both sides, I guess, um, but that can be forgiven in Blitz. Ultimately, I think... Zhang made a nice practical decision to go for this type of uh, type of game. Geary, I think, um, just didn't didn't have as much, I guess, experience. He doesn't play the white side of a dragon. He plays the white side of these moderns, but these tactics in terms of how it converted, I don't know, in Blitz just felt like he didn't quite have the threat on the position, and that led to some blunders. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Please give us a like, give us a subscribe, leave a comment if you're enjoying it. Share it on social media for us. We appreciate that, and I will see you around on chess.com.